This is the Master CX-5 and it's a bit like full fat original Coca-Cola. Yeah. Now you're probably wondering why that is. Okay, let me inform you. The Master CX-5 accounts for 25% of Master's global sales. The original Coca-Cola accounts for 25% of all global soft drink sales. So there you go, a little fact you've learned. I'll just put this down because I won't be drinking that because it's full of calories. Anyway, this car, it's probably the kind of vehicle you're gonna be looking at if you're considering something like a Ford Cougar, a Volkswagen Tiguan, because it's a decent sized family SUV. Now it starts from 25 and a half thousand pounds, but you can save an average of almost 3,000 pounds on one three car wow. In fact, if you click on the pop-up button, just up there, top right corner of the screen, there's actually a link below the video. You can go to CarWow to check out the latest and greatest deals or just simply Google CarWow and you can just go straight there. Now, one of the things I really like about the Mazda CX-5 is that it doesn't look that much different regardless of which model you go for. So even the lesser versions have lots of chrome about the place and look pretty much identical to the higher spec versions. The only real difference are the size of the alloy wheels. Now on the inside, there are a few upgrades that you get with the high spec versions. For instance, it's mainly just to do with this inlay here. So on the top spec car, you can have wood inlay. This is the mid one, so it has this kind of metallic -y wood effect. And then the H level car has something different. Still, all models get like these shiny effects around the vents. I like that. They also get this leatherette effect with stitching here on the dash, and it extends up here onto the door tops and down here. In fact, even down here, that's all soft and squidgy. The controls for the ventilation system, all very solid. In fact, all the controls are nicely damped. It feels like quite an expensive car in here. I also like the fact that you've got these little metallic edges to the window switches, feel expensive as does the control for the side mirrors. In fact, there's lots of shiny bits of trim about the place to brighten things up and down here, down here as well. Feels very, very premium, but then you work back here and this is like some of the most horrible plastic I've encountered in any car ever. Also, I'm not too impressed with the way this center console does just wiggle a little bit if you move it and what the heck is this? Look, CD player. Never going to use a CD. I just use Spotify, um, but I suppose I can store credit cards and stuff in there. Oh, and I almost sucked it into the player. And speaking of specs, here's a lowdown on the CX-5's equipment list. The Mazda CX-5 range starts with the SEL Nav Plus, and it has a seven inch infotainment screen with, as the name suggests, satellite navigation built in. It also gets Apple CarPlay and Android Auto dual zone climate control, an automatic radar guided cruise control, which you can set the distance that you want to stay from the car in front. And if you've got the automatic version, it'll even work in stop start traffic. Speaking of which, all models come with auto emergency braking as standard. The next level up is Sport Nav Plus and they get black leather seats, a Bose sound system with extra speakers and a heads up display so you don't have to take your eyes off the road to see what speed you're doing. And overall, I think the Sport Nav Plus is the pick of the range in terms of value for money. The GT Sport Nav Plus adds a 360 degree view camera to the reversing camera of the Sport Nav and the all round parking sensors that you get as standard with a normal SEL Nav. Fine nap leather for the seats, which is softer than this standard leather. And while all models have LED headlights, those on the top of the range car are actually adaptive so they can blank out part of their beam so they don't dazzle oncoming drivers. Overall then, the Mazda CX-5's equipment list has really impressed me. I'm also impressed with the layout of the dial. So you've got two analog dials, one for the rev counter, one for the speedo. Then there's a digital dial here with a little bit of extra information. Bit disappointed that Mazda didn't use the opportunity to let you control some other functions from the infotainment system through there, such as the radio and switch through different tracks and maybe show a little bit of navigation. But all you get for the infotainment system is this little screen on the top of the dash. Now it's in your eye line, which is good, but it's pretty small screen by today's standards. You can use it as a touch screen or I can swivel through the different menus using the control wheel. Actually, when you're driving, you can only use that. It doesn't let the touchscreen work anymore, just probably for safety reasons, but lots of other cars have touchscreens and I'd rather have the choice myself. Thank you very much, Mazda. If I'm brutally honest, I don't think it's particularly great. So it feels old fashioned. The graphics are low res. It's not the fastest to respond. The layout of it isn't great either. It's fiddly to use this control. It's just not as good as you think it's gonna be. So you do wanna use it static to do any programming of the sat nav. Ah, yeah, it's doing my head in already. All right, go back to the shortcut button. I can't zoom 
Does it pinch and zoom? No, it just moves around. I have to use this button to zoom in and out. Also, adding a waypoint can be a bit of a faff as well. It's just not all that easy to use. In fact, the specification of the infotainment system you get on a Hyundai Tucson is just superior. Finally then, let's talk about practicality here in the front. The position is bang on. Well, actually, the steering wheel is quite nice and sport. It feels good. There's an average amount of adjustment in it for this kind of car. What you might be concerned about is that you can't get the seat that low in the 6.5, but it doesn't matter because there's so much headroom here in the front that even if you're tall, you're going to be fine. And you can jack up the seat quite a long way to get a good view out if you're short, which is good news. Then in terms of cubby spaces, well, we've got a little storage area down here and a charging point, so you can just put your phone in there and just let it charge. You've also got some storage under here with a little tray, look at that. And there's two USB ports and another 12 volt socket in there. Look, there's some more room underneath if you need it. The location of the cup holders isn't ideal. I mean, they're big enough to take larger bottles as well as coffee cups. But if you look at this, you end up just resting your arm on the bottle and it sort of gets in the way of the gear selector a little bit not as bad as in some cars the door bins are pretty ideal though look at this one and a half litre bottle in there and you can even lay another 500 milliliter bottle down behind it so plenty of useful storage in the door bins but the glove box is just only so so yeah what's it like in the back though for people so one of the things I want to point out first of all about this 6.5 is that these rear doors, can you see, they open to 90 degrees, but the door isn't all that long. So it's less of an issue like trying to open it in tight spaces. Even though the door isn't huge, the actual door opening is big enough to maneuver and get in quite comfortably. And you just, well, flop down to the seat because it's about the right height for your hips. It's a really perfect height for getting in and out, which is ideal if you're carrying older relatives and they'll have plenty of space back here look i've got loads of room i'm 179 centimeters this seat's my usual driving position lots of knee room once again look at that loads of headroom people well over six foot will be fine here also because these seats are raised quite up a bit of a problem sometimes in the front but here in the back it means that you really can stretch out in it it is just a shame that you can't recline these seat backs look well you can <laughs> a little bit what like that much and an inch make all the difference it does actually make it a little bit better to tell you the truth when it comes to carrying three people at once it's all right because the footwells are big you do have this bit of hump in the floor the middle seat isn't too bad and it's doable just about it's not the most comfortable if you want to carry three people in the back at once you're going to be a little bit better off with a Volkswagen Tiguan because it just feels a little bit more roomy in fact if that's really important to you click up there on the pop-out banner or on the link below the video to watch my detailed review of the Volkswagen Tiguan going on with the back of this car so if I fold this down look you'll see you have a little extra storage area here with a USB input. There's two of them there, so two people can charge their mobile phones. Some weird storage area there, which I can only guess is for a pen, and then two cup holders here, though they are quite shallow. The door bins are a decent size, they're here in the back, so that's a litre bottle, no problem there. You've got some storage in the back of the seat backs, and it's not kind of cheapo net, it's blended in with the seat, which does look posh. Once again, the quality back here is really good. Much better quality here in the back than in a Kia Sportage, which just doesn't match the quality in the front, whereas here it does. It's just, you know, you don't feel like you're in the cheap seats at all. What's not so great though is this look. Roll down the rear window, doesn't go all the way down, so you can't really lean out. Kids might find that annoying. Another thing I find annoying is the fact that the coat hook is there. So if you want to hang a coat up with someone in the back, it just gets in the way. And look at this. Well, first thing you can notice is the headlining moving when I press the reading light button. But it's the fact that, look, it's old-fashioned filament bulbs, an orange bulb. Can't complain about fitting a child seat in here. It is relatively easy because you've got quite a lot of room to manoeuvre. The Isofix are okay to get at as well, so it's easy to install the base. Can be a bit of a problem if you want to carry two child seats in the back at once and try and squeeze someone in the middle because there isn't much room. But it is better in that respect than something like a Hyundai Tucson or the Kia Sportage yet again. Anyway, let's move on to the boot because this car's boot is about the same size as the Sportages and the Tucsons really. You're talking around 500 litres. It's quite a wide space. Now there is a bit of a boot lip, not much though. <laughs> you can easily lift stuff over that, not a problem at all. More of a problem is there's no hooks to hang shopping off, so I'm going to have to just get rid of my fake shopping. There are a few tethering points down here, down here, and there's 
couple more there. You have some underfloor storage here, but not much. If you look up there, you've got your tire repair kit. There are a few cubbies just here and here for some more storage here in the boot. So functionality isn't great, apart from this, which I absolutely love. Look, you've got three-way split folding rear seats, and I can do it from here. So that does the middle bit. Ta-da! Then I can do the other sides there like that. Go on, go down. Right, snug it on the seat belt a little bit. And then you've got a reasonably large load area there. It's pretty big and it's continuous pretty much the floor, so you can slide things to the front. It's very easy to pack it full as well because you've got this big wide opening. You can easily shove a bike in there without having to take any of its wheels off. With the seats in place, you can fit a baby buggy under the load cover and two small suitcases on top of two large suitcases. However, you can't carry two boxes underneath the load cover like you can in a Hyundai Tucson because in that car, you can lower the boot floor to just squeeze them in, but not here. Still, that's a minor complaint because this is a very practical car that's also supremely comfortable. However, this car isn't perfect. Here's five annoying things about it. All but the entry-level car has a heated steering wheel, which is good. What's not so good, though, is that it only heats this part of the steering wheel, which, yes, I know, ideally, you should have your hands a quarter to three, but some people like to rest their hands on the top and the bottom, and it's just not heated there. While the load cover is lovely and light, it's just a little bit too big to fit underneath the front floor, so you have to leave it there. The definition of the reversing camera is just terrible. It's like looking back into the 1990s. I mean, look at the awful graphics for the guidelines. While the Isofix anchor points for baby seat are easy to get to, after a while and plenty of use, this bit of leather just gets kind of parted. So it looks like there's just a hole in your seat. There's no central button to operate the central locking. Instead, you have to use the one on the driver's door and it's a little bit stiff and the way it's designed sort of hurts your fingers, especially when it's cold like today. Thankfully, this car has plenty of cool features to help make up for all this. Here's five. The car is fitted with something called IE loop. What happens is when you're slowing down or braking, the car recoups that lost energy and stores it in the battery so it can be used to power all the electrical items, and that helps improve the economy. This latest 6.5 is up to 90 kilos lighter than the previous 6.5, which is about the weight of me, plus an extra 15 kilos. In bends, the car automatically adjusts the throttle slightly, and you don't have to notice it, to increase either the amount of grip at the front tyres or the back tyres, a bit like a racing driver does to maximise grip, to enable them to go around corners as fast as possible. If you get the all-wheel drive version of the CX-5, it has 27 different sensors which can read the terrain you're driving on and the weather conditions and then decide how to distribute the power between the front wheels and the rear wheels. This new CX-5 is longer and lower than before and this makes it more aerodynamic which boosts efficiency. Let's talk about the engine. So there's three different ones to choose from. Now, avoid the two litre petrol because it's a little bit thirsty and not that nippy. You want one of the diesels. They're both 2.2 litres and there's a lower power version and a higher power version. All engines are available with an automatic gearbox if you want one. Though the higher power diesel engine car is the only CX-5 you can get with all wheel drive. Otherwise, they're all front wheel drive. Now, for more detail on the engine specifications and stuff like that, go to CarWow. All the details are there. In fact, while you're there, you can build your ideal CX-5 or any car for that matter, plug in all the details into our configurator and see what offers you can get back on them. So I did it on this car, this lower power 2.2 litre diesel Sport Nav Plus. Now it should cost £30,500, but I got an offer back for around £27,000. So click on the pop-out banner in the top right-hand corner of the screen to have a go with our configurator. Right, let's see what this 6.5 is like to drive in town. So I've obviously got a good view forward because I'm raised up and that helps me get over speed humps. In fact, it's pretty good over speed. I haven't hardly noticed them at all. When the road's broken and uneven like this surface here, you can feel that the suspension is a bit on the firm side. You do feel the car move around a bit beneath you. It's not as jiggly as a Hyundai Tucson, but it's not the softest suspension in the world. And let's see what it's like for maneuverability. I'm gonna do a U-turn around this mini roundabout. Come on. Hopefully it's not gonna to be too embarrassing. Oh, can I make this? Oh, it's tight. Sorry, people. The turning circle isn't the best. You get a better turning circle with a Kia Sportage. In fact, if you wanna see my detailed video review of the Kia Sportage, just click up there on the pop-out button in the top right-hand corner of the screen and go watch it.
There's also a link you can follow below the video. Let's see how easy this car is to park. So the first thing to note is that the brakes are nice and progressive. You don't end up suddenly jerking to a stop. The gear shift is fairly notchy, but in a good way, makes it feel sporty. I do like the fact that the mirrors are big and I can actually see the curbs. The steering is precise, but it's not too heavy. So it's easy to go from lock to lock like that when you're having a nightmare parking like I clearly am. That's not the car's fault because actually, view out the back's good, view out the mirrors is good. That wasn't too bad at all, that's nice and neat. This is quite an easy car to park considering the size of it. Get out on the motorway and this car's a really good cruiser, so it's reasonably quiet, feels planted as well at speed, and this 2.2 litre, 150 horsepower diesel, I'm at 60 miles an hour, if I floor it, it's got enough grunt to overtake. Come on, see how long it takes me to get to 70, and that, is 70, so not too bad. It's supposed to do 58 miles per gallon, this engine, but I'm getting 44.7, which actually, for the real world, isn't too bad at all. Now, one of the things I really like about the CX-5 is when you encounter a twisty road, that slightly firm suspension, which can be annoying in town, does pay off because it stops the car leaning in the bends and it goes around corners really, really well for a tour vehicle. It's actually, dare I say it, fun. Now, if you want to check out the very latest and greatest deals on the Mazda CX-5, click just up there on the pop-out banner, or there's a link below the video you can follow, or just Google CarWow Mazda CX-5 deals, and you can go straight there. So then, what's my verdict on this car? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should shortlist the Mazda CX-5. It's a practical, stylish, lovely to drive family SUV. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it useful. I actually really enjoyed the Mazda CX-5. I think it's a great car. The only thing really for me that lets it down was that infotainment system. Now, if you were looking for this kind of car and you want something with seven seats or just want something as an alternative, click down there to watch my detailed review of the Skoda Kodiak. You can also click on our logo to subscribe to this channel. And of course, if you want to see the best deals on this CX-5, just click over there on the deals box to what price you can get one of these for.